Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to the last sessions of the Astana Economic Forum and the World Anti-Crisis Conference. My name is Mark Cousin. I am the Executive Director of Reinventing Bretton Woods. I would like first to welcome Prime Minister of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Mr. Srik Akhmetov, who is here who is today. He will be speaking uh, uh, and provide hopefully a good context of our conversation. I'm also pleased to welcome um, my co-host here, Riz Khan, who is a TV host and producer for Algera International, who will moderate the panel. The way we want to proceed, if you agree, will be that we want to keep it very informal. So I would like to maybe start off by providing a little summary about what was said over the last two days, and maybe try to raise some questions. Hopefully you will be able to answer them, or if not, you can start with another angle and Ritz will also moderate uh, the session afterwards. So I will start by providing a sense of summary of what was said here at this anti-crisis conference. We'll follow by a speech of the Prime Minister, and after Ritz will be able to interact with you. The way you want to proceed, if you want to, to speak, you will raise your nameplate and we'll give you the floor. So what was interesting during the last two days was clearly that we are facing a major transition in the global financial system. One of the chief economists, uh, deputy chief economists uh, of the IMF, Thomas Elbling, lay out the scenario of uh, the current state of the global economy, and he called it the three-speed global recovery, where Europe is in recessions, emerging markets are going to grow by 5%, and the US 2%. One of the questions is that scenario is going to be permanent or temporary. The question that we have to think about, are we entering a period of stagnations? And if so, how can we fix it? The other issue that we talk a lot over the last two days has been the issue of monetary policies and spillovers. Are we relying too much on monetary policies? And if so, what are going to be the risks? We talk a lot about the risk in the international financial system. A lot of vulnerabilities are emerging. We see that liquidity is flowing to the system and flow to asset markets. This is happening. We are seeing a lot of corporate bonds who are issuing weaker covenants. We are seeing that everyone is looking for yield. We are seeing insurance by Zambia, Mongolia. We are seeing that uh, insurance companies are moving away to go to underwriting. And we are seeing a new wave of financial engineering. Buyback, companies are trying to buy their own shares to retire equity. So, you remember when we discussed the previous crisis, one of the main origins of that crisis for a lot of people were that interest rates were too low for too long. Are we preparing a new set of crises? And if this is the case, what should be the policy actions by policymakers? Last of not least, in order to be more optimistic, it seems to me that the fact that this global finance is in transitions, we can clearly see that we need to channel savings to the world investment there was a lot of discussions related to infrastructure. In emerging markets, there are a lot of need to finance infrastructure, Brazil, China, India, but also in Europe. What would be the best mechanism to channel savings to finance infrastructure and to revive long-term and sustainable growth? So this is more or less, I think, the four questions I have in mind, trying to make sure that we're not going to go to into a period of stagnations. Are we, should we be worried about this Rylance on monetary policy, that's the fact that central bankers are becoming so very active. And last but not least, we will find a way to revive long-term growth through the financing of infrastructure. We can, of course, raise other questions. We talk a lot about the new global financial architectures, the need to recalibrate the governance of the international financial system. We talk about the role of the IMF. We talk about the, the need for emerging market to be more proactive in shaping up that architecture. So I will stop here. Uh, I will give the floor to the Prime Minister. I know that Prime Minister, you will need to leave in around the f uh, 5.50. So I give you the floor, and after this, you will moderate. And if anyone has other questions, other comments, he will be free to do so. Thank you. Prime Minister. Thank you. От имени правительства Республики Казахстан хочу выразить искреннюю признательность каждому из вас за участие в шестом Астанинском экономическом форуме и Всемирной антикризисной конференции, поддержанной Организацией Объединенных Наций. 
Главной целью проведения Всемирной антикризисной конференции, инициированной президентом нашей страны, является поиск путей решения накопившихся проблем мировой экономики. Очевидно, мировая экономика остается в состоянии неопределенности, серьезно испытывая страны на прочность. Процесс восстановления мировой экономики характеризуется неустойчивостью, и в ряде стран наблюдается рецессия, рост безработицы. Поэтому мы считаем важным и актуальным сформировать такие принципы многосторонних отношений, чтобы предотвратить фрагментацию мировой экономики, позволяющих превентивно и системно решать глобальные вызовы мировому сообществу. В этой связи Казахстан, как член Организации Объединенных Наций, предложил мировому сообществу открыто и комплексно обсудить имеющиеся риски мировой экономики и выработать приемлемый формат предотвращения возможных негативных последствий. Анализ мировых тенденций свидетельствует о том и необходимости выбора эффективных инструментов и мер, и мер экономической политики, их оптимального сочетания и взаимного согласования в целях поддержания стабильного экономического роста и социального благополучия и прогресса во всем мире. Поэтому на площадках Астанинского экономического форума рассматривается большой спектр вопросов, охватывающих самые разные аспекты международного и национального развития в современных условиях. Они достаточно адекватно отражают наиболее важные глобальные процессы и вызовы мировой экономики. В частности, дискуссии охватывали и охватывают обсуждение актуальных проблем и перспектив мировой финансовой системы, развитие инноваций, человеческого капитала, зеленой экономики, формирование интеграционных процессов, модернизации экономики и социального развития в современных условиях. Уверен, что обсуждаемые в рамках антикризисной конференции конструктивные идеи дадут надежный импульс общему делу, выводу экономики на новый этап сбалансированного экономического роста. Мировой финансовый кризис показал необходимость совместного решения вопросов поддержания глобальной экономической стабильности и устойчивости. И основой для решения сложных вопросов и вызовов современности должен стать широкий диалог и взаимодействие. Учет интересов всех сторон и государств мира, в том числе развивающихся, которые играют все более и более заметную роль в глобальных экономических процессах. Мы приветствуем все меры, предпринимаемые на международном и национальном уровнях, направленные на стабильное развитие мировой экономики, восстановление доверия к рынкам и снижение финансовой уязвимости. В частности, такие системные усилия предпринимаются государствами, участниками G20, БРИКС, Азиатским партнерством по укреплению финансовой стабильности и снижению экспортной диспропорции. В рамках текущего форума предложено разработать декларацию Всемирной антикризисной конференции, которая будет направлена на рассмотрение очередного саммита государств-участников G20. Надеюсь, участники сегодняшнего диалога лидеров выразят свои мнения, предложения к данной декларации. Особо отмечу, что в 2012 году Казахстаном инициировано создание коммуникативной интеллектуальной площадки G-Global. Она открывает новые возможности для всеобщего взаимопонимания и диалога как между государствами, так и на уровне неправительственных организаций, политиков и общественных деятелей, экспертов и ученых. Это адекватный формат всестороннего диалога по актуальным вопросам современной повестки дня. Как известно, Казахстан предпринимает все необходимые меры антикризисного реагирования. Государством были своевременно приняты меры по стабилизации экономики и финансовой системы, которые в целом не позволили допустить рецессии экономики в нашей стране. Этому способствовали, прежде всего, меры, направленные на диверсификацию и модернизацию экономики, создание благоприятного инвестиционного и делового климата. Как вы знаете, Казахстан характеризуется открытой, достаточно растущей экономикой. В 2012 году валовый внутренний продукт на душу населения превысил уровень в 12 тысяч долларов США, 
что обеспечило вхождение Казахстана в группу стран со средним уровнем доходов. И в последние 10 лет средний ежегодный рост экономики нашей страны составлял порядка 7%, что позволило обеспечить удвоение валового внутреннего продукта в сравнении с 2002 годом. Мы стремимся создать самые благоприятные условия для ведения бизнеса. Об этом уже говорили, что по оценке Всемирного банка Казахстан занял в 2012 году 49 место в рейтинге Doing Business. За последние 20 лет в страну привлечено более 170 миллиардов долларов иностранных инвестиций. И мы приглашаем всех желающих вести свой бизнес в Казахстане. Находясь на стыке Европы и Азии, Казахстан имеет достаточно широкие возможности для расширения транспортно-коммуникационных связей между всеми континентами и государствами. Для этого в стране создаются необходимые транспортные транзитные магистрали. Большой потенциал для инвестиций открывает создание единого экономического пространства Казахстана, России и Белоруссии. Это новый рынок объемом 170 миллионов человек, где имеются не только богатые природные ресурсы, но и серьезные производственные, человеческие, агропродовольственные и сервисно-технологический потенциал. Большие надежды мы связываем также с развитием альтернативной возобновляемой энергии. Астана выбрана местом проведения международной выставки Экспо-2017. Основной тематикой, которая определена, энергия будущего. Это станет реальным практическим шагом перехода к принципам зеленой экономики. И мы приглашаем инвесторов и страны к сотрудничеству в этой сфере. Это большое поле для совместной деятельности и международного взаимодействия. В целом, хочу подчеркнуть, Казахстан всегда открыт для экономического сотрудничества и взаимодействия в различных форматах. В заключение отмечу, что мы уделяем большое внимание всем инициативам и предложениям, которые были высказаны в ходе 6-го Астанинского экономического форума и Всемирной антикризисной конференции. Еще раз хочу выразить вам большую признательность за участие в работе форума и конференции. Желаю успехов и благополучия. Спасибо за внимание. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much. Um, I'm Riz Khan. I and Mark will be uh, moderating now, trying to get as much uh, together in this final session as possible. So Mark and myself will be looking for people wanting to contribute and ask questions. I respectfully ask you to keep your uh, contributions brief, as there are so many people wanting to take part, and we don't have that much time. I am going to start off with just a quick question to one of the people responsible and behind the uh, Astana Economic Forum, uh, the Senate Deputy of the Parliament uh, here in Kazakhstan and co-chair of the conference, Mr. Serik uh, Nigorbekov, and, and ask, really, I guess, as we, as we wrap things up, I would like to get your perspective on how you see the Astana Economic Forum, a forum having developed over these six years, and perhaps what it's really achieving. The past если точнее, пять лет Астанинский экономический форум он вырос до достаточно серьезных размеров. Сегодня в рамках нашего форума за эти три дня было проведено 73 крупных мероприятий, были обсуждены многие вопросы. Особо хочется отметить аутрич мероприятия российского председателя G20, он прошел удачно. Были приняты проекты резолюции для G20. Сегодня были приняты итоговые документы Всемирной антикризисной конференции. В работе форума участвовало более 10 тысяч участников из 132 государств. Теперь планируется на данном уникальность шестого Астанинского форума в том, что почти на всех круглых столах были приняты тематики мероприятий, которые пройдут в 2014 году в городе Астане. И в течение года на коммуникативной площадке G-Global будут обсуждаться все мероприятия, тематики 6-го Астанинского экономического форума, то есть происходит диалектическая интеграция 7-го Астанинского форума и коммуникативной площадки G-Global. 
So thank you very much. Um, looking for contributions here, I think uh, Mr. Michael Binion of The Times had something to add. Thank you very much. It's actually a question I'd like to pose, uh, particularly to the main participants, and that is uh, picking up the Prime Minister's point of view, uh, his statement that the main goal of the conference has been to find ways to solve the crisis. And I've heard some extremely interesting discussions and ideas from all the experts who've been on the panels. What I wanted to know, though, is how confident are the members of this panel that their deliberations over the past two days and the proposals that are summed up in the draft declaration will actually have any influence on either G8 or G20 or indeed the other big powers in the world that actually simply go their own way. One of the points made by one of the speakers I heard was that uh, we all came together, at least the leaders of all the developed nations and indeed all the members of G20 came together impressively after the beginning of the crisis and all decided that what was needed was coordinated action. And then after the crisis had subsided a little bit, everyone simply went away and did their own thing. And is there not the danger that that's what's going to happen again? How can resolutions taken at this meeting here today and yesterday actually have some effect to stop that happening again? I will leave that open for response. Uh, Mr. Romano Prodi, please. Well, uh, two considerations. First of all, we are speaking a crisis. You know, I, I, I am. I, I think that we are in a moment of adjustment, you know, because uh, crisis is in Europe, semi-crisis in the United States, Asia is still going on, you know, there are some problems, but if China grows 7.7 .7 instead of 8, it's not, it's not such a crisis, you know. So it's, uh, uh, after this long period of adjustment, the world will be absolutely different. But I think that, uh, you know, can go on the same. But uh, uh, your question, I tell you my experience, you know, I have been, I participate to 10 G8 in my life, five as Italian Prime Minister, five as President of the European Commission, and I have seen the uh, decline of it, you know. Uh, in the beginning, uh, you know, uh, in the end, uh, the G8 became some sort of NGO, I mean, let's say uh, 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 the target was not anymore the reform of the war, but to give some aid. And honestly, we never delivered what, what we told, you know. So why? Because clearly you couldn't take decision when uh, the real players of the war, they were not around the table. So we, and I personally pushed for the G20. And G20 was born, you know, and I tried to analyze well why is not delivering, as you say. First of all, there are also technical reasons that you need to, to have action, you need a big secretariat, you need a continuity of action, you need, uh, let's say, a strong uh, technical body that is going on in which people meet and work together always, you know, and this is not the case. But there is another problem. Look, why should they agree should the G20 agree on the reform? You know, in this moment, the United States does not want to take any major reform because, look, comparatively, it's not so bad, the U.S. situation in the world. You know, they have some advantage. I don't want to take you know, the old De Gaulle uh, uh, expression, but, you know. And, you know, take the new countries, China. Why should China want a reform that... Uh, in five years' time, when the financial system is fixed, when the economy is fixed, uh, China will get off much better than now, you know. So when you are in a moment of waving like that, it's almost impossible, in my opinion, to have a great reform. You may have some technical adjustment, some, you know. The problem is not to give too many expectations to that, you know. It's necessary, G20 is positive but only for minor things, because the major, said that they need a clear set of power. Think, and I am ending, uh, why the last change was in Bretton Woods in 1994, 1944. 1944, only United States were, was able to, to, to do that. 
there was one country only, one structure, and you know, the reform was easy, well, easy. It, it was possible to do. Now, the problem is much more political, you know. You should need an agreement between, uh, you know, the leading states with the, with, the, with the BRICS to have some sort of uniform body, you know. Enlarge it to the G20 was a necessity, but uh, having a political unity is more difficult than before. Mr. Prodi, thank you very much. Again, I ask our distinguished guests to um, hold up their name cards if they would like to contribute something. Mark, I'm going to count on you to see around this side because I can't see anything either here. Um, but oh, here we have here next to me, please, uh, uh, Mr. Mohammed Suleiman Al Jasser, who is the uh, Minister of Economy and Planning of Saudi Arabia. Thank you very much, and, and thank you, Astana, for this wonderful uh, conference. Uh, just to follow up on what Romano Prodi mentioned. I mean, the G7 and the G8, when they had to deal with crises, they were crises in other countries, in the developing countries. And also, at that time, the financial system of the world was much simpler than it is. You get few central bankers from the G3 or the G4 or the G5 meeting in New York at the Federal Reserve and deciding what to do. And bang, things happened. Well, the, the world has changed significantly since the creation of the G20. And the G20 was created because the shift in economic power or the recomposition of the global economic power that now it's much more diversified. So yes, the G20 is less manageable than the G7 or the, or, or the G5. But I think the G20, it was established and for 10 years it was considered to be useless because there were no serious crises. But when 2008, and the Lehman Brothers problem hit, the G20 was there and they met. And I mentioned today, April 2009 in London, that was a landmark meeting. If the G20 was not there, I don't know what could have happened. Yes, it's not a world government. It does not make very serious decisions, but it improved the coordination. Everybody went out of there saying no trade protectionism. Let's do what is good for, for everybody. And the significant economies where the problems had arisen, they were put in the spot that they have to get their house in order. So it's not everybody telling them what to do, but look, you have to do what has to be done. And I think that is where the paradigm shift in global economic management has, uh, has taken place. The question there, I don't think we should expect too much from conferences like these, because if the, our expectations are too high, then of course we will be disappointed. But the fact that we get together and exchange ideas and thoughts, at least we will eliminate the bad ideas and we will converge to some good ideas. And I think this meeting and the conference we've had, I think we've had quite an exchange of good ideas. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I see that uh, Mr. Uh, Nikola um, Gruevsky of uh, uh, the Yugoslav, uh, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, the Prime Minister has his uh, card up. Thank you. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, the, the crisis that is existing now in Europe, I agree with Mr. Cody that now the, the crisis existing in Europe, European Union, especially monetary zone, uh, is the crisis with deep roots. It's a real crisis. Many people are saying that uh, it's a matter of confidence or matter of perception, or even some believe that it's a reflection of psychology, reflection of the, of the markets and so on. It's not true. We have real crisis. We have real debts. The debts are existing. Uh, if some country has 90% uh, state debt of GDP, or 100% or 130% debt of GDP, and current budget deficit of 7-8%, it's a real problem there. It's a not problem of confidence, and confidence cannot, become, cannot be returned back with the statements of the politicians or even the statements of the central bank leaders or something like that. It's necessary concrete measures uh, which are well known. That's not, the diagnosis here and the measures are also on the table. Uh, they are known. Everybody knows what has to be done, but because of the political reasons, because of calculations of 
the, 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 the leaders in some, and the governments in some uh, countries postponing um, the measures, uh, we, we have prolonged crisis. If, if the measures which are well known were, were uh, implemented um, uh, much faster than, than it is actually happening, we would talk probably for the crisis which is behind us. But because most of the or important part of the measures that were recommended from IMF, from other international institutions, from European Central Bank, and so on from the um, experts in the world on different uh, events, uh, talking on different events, are, were, were partly uh, inter introduced, partly implemented, and partly postponed, it's actually the, the reason of uh, why, why the confidence is not here and why the, the crisis, crisis is uh, prolonged, is, uh, is, still, is still here. So that's, that's a matter of uh, more courage of the governments to sometimes, if necessary, to cut the budget deficits, some kind, so, sometimes where it's necessary to strengthen the super, supervision of the, of the banks or changing the permissible activities of financial institutions or adapting the balance, balance of the banks, capital markets and, and shadow, um, shadow banks in the financial system or changing the system for su uh, supervisory oversight and intervention across borders or any other measures that are discussed and that are well known and that are accepted. There are measures that are maybe not broadly accepted but also there are measures which are broadly accepted but are not implemented. So it's a matter of not enough implementation or implementation or not on time implementation of the measures that are necessary mainly because of the political reasons. Thank you. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much. I'm going to ask at this stage just for us to thank uh, Prime Minister Serik Akhmetov for uh, helping us get started. I know he has to uh, attend some urgent business and will be leaving us, but thank you, sir, for uh, getting our dialogue going. We will continue with the dialogue, but please, a round of applause for the Prime Minister of Kazakhstan. Next up, uh, Mr. Sergei Glazev. Спасибо. Вопрос, который вы поставили, действительно волнует всех участников конференции и в особенности российских представителей, которым принимать двадцатку в сентябре руководителей глав 20 государств мира. И мы, конечно, очень заинтересованы в том, чтобы те договоренности, которые достигаются, реализовывались бы на практике. Но если говорить откровенно, единственная линия, которая сегодня реализуется, это линия на открытость и на отказ от протекционизма. Как вы знаете, и двадцатка, и восьмерка принимают решения на основе консенсуса. Выработать консенсусное решение в ситуации, когда у участников разные интересы, очень сложно. Среди участников двадцатки есть группа стран, которые имеют возможность имитировать резервные мировые валюты. Это Соединенные Штаты, Великобритания, Европейский Союз и Япония. И остальные, которые являются донорами эмитентов мировых валют. Если говорить математически, у них интересы противоположные. Те, кто имитирует мировые валюты, они вынуждены наращивать государственные долги потому что они имитируют эти валюты под рост своих обязательств. Остальные в этой игре вынуждены финансировать их долги. Поэтому двадцатка разделяется на тех, кто печатает деньги, и тех, кто покупает их долги. И неэквивалентность внешнеэкономического обмена, которая возникает вследствие этого, достигает уже за критических размеров. Скажем, если говорить о обмене России – с внешним миром, то мы должны иметь профицит торгового баланса, сверхприбыль от экспорта нефти аккумулировать в резервах, резервы вкладывать в покупку долговых обязательств эмитентов мировых валют, а наши корпорации в силу отсутствия длинных денег внутри финансовой системы вынуждены занимать деньги опять же у эмитентов мировых валют. Ежегодные потери, которые российская финансовая система несет от такого неэквивалентного обмена, колеблются от 50 до 100 миллиардов долларов в год.
пока цены на нефть высокие, этот обмен может продолжаться. Но дисбалансы растут. И главная проблема, которая, как мне кажется, должна быть решена, как при такой разности, даже полярности интересов, выйти на консенсус, который даст нам инструменты борьбы с кризисом. Казахстан преуспел как одна из лучших стран в части привлечения иностранных инвестиций. Казахстанские проекты показывают, как можно сочетать национальные преимущества страны, которая не имеет возможности имитировать мировую валюту с привлечением долгосрочных инвестиций с мирового рынка. Мне кажется, этот пример можно использовать в более широком контексте, потому что сколько бы мы ни говорили про финансовый кризис, выход из этого финансового кризиса заключается в развитии новейших технологий. Рост нового технологического уклада – это единственное, что сегодня может вытянуть экономику из кризиса. Поэтому главный вопрос, как связать избыточные деньги, которые сегодня имитируются четверкой мировых резервных валют, в новейших технологиях, которые растут сегодня с темпом 35% в год. Нанотехнологии, био, информационно-коммуникационные. Здесь, как мне кажется, нужны долгосрочные международные целевые программы и международные финансовые инструменты. Либо международные долговые инструменты, такие как глобальные облигации для развития инфраструктурных проектов крупных, либо международные налоговые инструменты, такие как налог на финансовые транзакции, которые сегодня обсуждаются с международным механизмом реализации этих денег в крупных мировых проектах развития. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Mr. Wu Hongbo, the Under Secretary General of the UN, uh, who heads the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Thank you for your patience, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, moder uh, moderator and uh, dear colleagues here. Um, we all agree that the world economic recovery has been slow and uneven uh, from country to country. And there are a lot of problems uh, we have to deal with uh, nowadays. Um, well, the reason why the recovery has been so slow and uh, we will not foresee the strong comeback of the economy in the next few years, because we have some profound problems we have not been dealt with success, um, efficiently. Uh, for example, um, there is no efficient uh, regulatory mechanism uh, of the uh, monetary system um, worldwide in place. Are we dealing successfully or efficiently about the problem of a shadow banking system? Not yet. Are we dealing successfully the question of monetary institutions which are too big to fall? Not yet. And second area I would say is the relationship between real economy and the virtual economy. I think from the crisis, the people become to realize that too much monetary leverage does not feed people. It's the real economy that produces what people need. Thirdly, it's the relations, it's, it's the question of consumption and production. This is a very serious issue. Let me give you an example. The food produced in the area, this sub sahara area, supposed to be the very poorest the area in the world, on the annual basis, is 230 million tons. 230 million tons. And the food wasted in the developed world is how much? 220 million tons. Is that sustainable? No. So the fourth area is uh, something that has been debated uh, worldwide. That is austerity policies and the economic st stimulus. Which goes first? Well, in some countries where the unemployment is very serious, the economy is slow, the financial tightening policy would produce more negative effects than expected. So people have to 
make proper balance between the two. So we, we believe that holistic approach should be adopted towards this issue. The fifth one is the, um, the quantitative easing. I think some countries are benefiting from these monetary policies, others are suffering. So we have so many problems at hand. Then we are tackling them in different forums and different platforms of discussions. So what are we going to do next? I have to congratulate organizers of this forum and organizers of the discussions that we have some ideas. We have some ideas, but where should the ideas go? As we have mentioned, G20 is going to take place very soon. So many of our suggestions contained in declaration may constitute meaningful inputs for the consideration. What is more important is the discussions in the United Nations. We all know that by 2015, when the Millennium Development Goals will reach its deadline, the world community need a new one. That is a sustainable development agenda. There are two cornerstones for that sustainability um, program. One is eradication for poverty. There's no doubt about that because even if we have been successful to slash the people in poverty by half, we still have a half of the people living in poverty. That, in, in figure term, around about over one billion people. That's a great deal. Secondly is sustainability. All the areas I identified, if you call them problems, they are not sustainable. So the United Nations, with all the member states, trying to combine the three dimensions together, economic, social, and environmental. Sustainability is the key to all the problems we are facing. So this is very important. In China, we say, Crisis contained of two characters. One symbolizes crisis, the other symbolizes opportunity. Once we handle and overcome all the crises, we have a new opportunity. We hope we can get that. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Mr. Dominic Strauss-Kahn, thank you very much for your patience, sir. Uh, you're up next. Thank you. I would like just to come back for a minute to uh, the question of the G20, which has been raised by Romano and Mohammed. I think one of the clear experience we have from the last years is that, uh, as Mohammed rightly said, in 2009, in 2010, the head of state were so afraid of what was going on that they could accept to make a collective decision and to try to play a cooperative game. And that's what's happened in, in London in April 2009 and after the following quarters. Probably, as you say, the decision which has been made at this time uh, make it possible for the world to avoid a crisis that at this time most had in mind could, could be as big as the Great Depression. The question is that uh, after one or two years, the leaders are not afraid anymore. Wrongly, but they're not afraid anymore. And so everybody's going back home to try to deal with domestic problems, forgetting that there is no domestic solution to global problems. So we're now in a situation where the G20 is becoming something very formal with, frankly, not a lot of interest in the discussion. Um, it's going to join other bodies like the UN and others, which of course all are useful, 
but at no more are no more the kind of body that we had at the beginning, which means that the, well, what I mean is a body where people really wanted to make decisions, were able to say, okay, we're going to do that, and then in the coming, in the following weeks, this thing had been done. It's true for uh, increasing the public expenditure, accepting more deficit. I'm not going to argue of if it was the right policy or not the right policy, but at least it has been done, and again, I think it avoided the crisis. Now we're no more in the situation. We don't have a body anymore where this kind of decision can be made. The G7 or G8 is too small, of course, because most of emerging countries, all emerging countries, are out. The G20 is a funny animal created by Clinton, you remember, on a basis which was more political basis and the composition of the G20 is a bit surprising. And as I say, it's becoming more and more formal. And the IMF, which played a big role during the crisis, is now a bit on the side, even in Europe. So there's no institution or nobody today where cooperation can take place. And that, in my view, is the most frightening fact for the coming years, because we need a cooperative game. There's no other solution to get out of where we are. It's true in Europe, but it's true outside Europe. And we don't have the body, the place to do that. At the same time, probably we may not have the economic leaders who are interested in that because they have their own problem at home, which I can understand, their own political questions and problems. But so the main point for me is what kind of, what institution, what set of people, what grouping is likely to take the lead and propose solution that will be able to be applied all around the world. If not, if not, we won't find a solution to the situation we are in. Some part of the world we go on with high, rather high growth level. That's the BRICS, even the US. Europe will not. And if, if Europe doesn't, it's still 25% of global GDP. If Europe doesn't find a solution, then the consequences will be big on all the rest of the world. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a common problem and we need common solution, but we don't have the tools anymore to do it. So thank you very much. We're also honored to have with us uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq with us, uh, Mr. Raush uh, Nouri Sidek Shoes. And sir, I know you had something to contribute as well. Yes, definitely. Thank you. <clears throat> Economics of most countries, including Iraq, did not remain unaffected by the crisis. I mean, the economics of most countries, including Iraq, did not remain unaffected by the crisis. However, its impact on Iraq were limited. And it was possible to contain them to a large extent. This could mainly be attributed to stability of Iraq's revenues and lack of Iraqi investments abroad. These and other factors have enabled Iraq to mitigate the effects of the crisis internationally. The same reasons will enable Iraq to contribute in addressing some aspects of the crisis. What is known is Iraq, Iraq's revenues are protected and Iraq is enjoying regular increase. Thus, Iraq as a supplier of energy can be an internationally stabilizing economic factor and have, a direct, have direct and indirect effects on various economic aspects. We have adopted an oil policy that focuses on modern technology and specialized CADA in order to boost production rates and meet market demands. We also have succeeded in attracting major foreign companies, easing contracting processes and putting in place flexible banking and other procedures all with the aim of promoting investments in the oil sector. We worked on developing and strengthening Iraqi private sector, enabling foreign and national investment, and took a series of decisions and decreed legislations to support the private sector to assume its role in the economic reform process and, diversif and diversifying res its re resources. 
Currently, we are reviewing our economic programs towards further easing and encouraging investments. We continue to adopt investment programs to, to develop the industrial, mineral, agricultural, and services by promoting effective public-private sector partnerships. It is worthwhile indicating that Iraq's annual budget this year totals $118 billion, which is the largest in its history, out of which $47 billion have been allocated for investment projects. I like now here to indicate the necessity of harmonizing our national arrangements to develop domestic economy and achieve sustained, sustainable growth with international arrangements to tackle such crises. Thus, initiatives such as the G Global and others, certainly uh, international institutions just like UN and G20 and initiatives like this forum and others may uh, uh, and this forum and others are of extreme importance to exchange expertises and create this desired harmony. My gratitude for the invitation and I indicate my appreciation of all efforts that enable to an excellent and an excellently organized event. Thank you very much. So thank you. I ask now next for uh, the, the President of Bulgaria, uh, Mr. Georgi Parnov of, uh, Parinov, to uh, give his contribution. Thank you for your patience, sir. I would like to share some impressions. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome the initiative of G Global. Защото за разлика от други формати, които сепарират Я спира вода? Нет? Yes, нормально. Да. Исках да кажа, че приветствам инициативата G Global защото за разлика от други формати, които сепарират, които затварят а, търсенето на решения, тази инициатива разчита на включването, на приобщаването. No. I, I don't think we have English translation at this stage for this. So... So would you be patient with me and we'll see if we can arrange that and I'll ask you to come back to us with your contribution. So be patient with us, okay. sir, and we'll ask you to, to, to do that. We'll try to fix that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, the advisor to the president of uh, Afghanistan, Mr. Yahya Marouf, is uh, with us as well. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, if you allow me, I would like to pick up on... Uh, some comments, very relevant, important comments that were made by the previous uh, interventions. Uh, I think we, uh, we agreed, or there is a consensus on three major points. One is that we are um, in a situation of a crisis. Uh, that crisis may be um, in, in certain part of the world, but it doesn't mean that you can contain it to that part. So it is traveling and is finally going to, uh, to get to us at a certain point. The second is that we have some mechanism, governmental mechanism like the G20 and other groups, that they may be reluctant to, um, to bend to certain uh, demands uh, that can make it easier for, for the rest of the uh, world or, or uh, those who are particularly affected. The third point is that why we are here. I think the major point here, the objective is that we have to put our house together in terms of analyzing the, the crisis and, and also uh, providing understanding and then to open a dialogue. 
And I think this is, this is what we can consider the objective of this uh, uh, round table of this type of meeting, which is now a viable mechanism, the Astana Forum. I also want to, at this point, express a very um, a note of thanks to the organizer and uh, also what uh, uh, has been achieved over the last few years. Now, the point is that we also have some, uh, the, the third world countries have certain um, mechanism at their disposal that they would like to see how they can uh, mobilize this uh, mechanism and how they can mobilize uh, their thoughts about um, to identify their needs, immediate needs, and how they can deal with what is expected to come our way. Now, what we see is the, um, the major mechanism that are on, in our hands, which is very um, is accepted and it's um, all the instruments of uh, joining uh, major uh, international monetary institutions like IMF, the World Bank, and those that the countries um, have already uh, been uh, a part of that for many years and uh, half a century now almost. Now we see in many cases these instruments are, or these mechanisms are not so much as useful as it used to, uh, to be or was thought to be. When we come to the crisis, the test of these institutions is now uh, something that we have to see. Now, I will tell you, for many of the countries, the conditions that are imposed nowadays by uh, IMF or the World Bank is pushing most of the countries to think a different way. They're, they are even thinking of uh, a sort of um, uh, downgrading their cooperation with these major international institutions. Um, so I guess this is not something that we can find a problem only to say to the North and South. And I think, as in the United Nations, as everywhere, we need a North and South dialogue, we need a North and South uh, discussion, and a North and South agreed solution. Uh, so I think preparation of this type of meetings for the major meetings where we can exercise some influence in terms of um, monitoring situation and preventing um, the exacerbation of the situation or the crisis is very useful. And I think this is, uh, this is what we have, uh, uh, we are doing uh, uh, to achieve here. Thank you very much for giving me the promise. Thank you. Again, my apologies to the uh, former Bulgarian President Georgi Parvanov. Uh, I think we have that sorted out now, sir. Благодаря господин председател. Преди всичко искам да изразя своята подкрепа за инициативата Жи Глобал, която според мен отваря, която предполага включване, принципа на включване за разлика от другите формати, които сепарират, които обособяват част от страните, вземащи решения. Второ, намирам за важен факт, че в тези кръгли маси се събират представители на политиката, на дипломацията, на науката, на управлението на банковия и други сектори, т.е. получава се една интердисциплинарна дискусия, която поне за нас, политиците, е много важна. Аз ще взема отношение към политическите аспекти, които бяха поставени от част от участниците в разговора. За мен големия въпрос е дали ще има лидерство в търсенето на решения. В много от дискусиите, които имах възможността да чуя, или започваха, или завършваха с въпроса чакайте да видим какво ще стане след еди кои си избори, след изборите в една или в друга страна. Но изборите са много, а изборът трябва да бъде направен бързо. Аз не съм оптимист с 
че ще има много чуваемост в някои от споменатите по-тесни формати. За част от идеите няма чуваемост дори в рамките на една такава ефективна общност, каквато Европейския съюз. Там често говорим на различни гласове. Там решенията се вземат в един относително по-тесен кръг, а се изпълняват от всички. Но мисля, че тези идеи неизбежното ще бъде наложено от хората, преди всичко от тези, които плащат високата социална цена на кризата. Говоря от името на страни, преди всичко от Юго-Источна Европа, които изкарах един тежък преход към пазарна економика, сега са в състояние на тежка криза. В тези страни социалното недоволство от търсенето на решение по кризата нараства. Дори една България, която е остров на стабилността, която често се сочи от европейските страни като добър пример за финансова стабилност. Правителството падна преди два месеца. Сега имаме парламентарна криза. Засилват се крайните, мога да кажа, антисистемни настроени. И това е един голям проблем, върху който трябва да се замислим. Разбирам, че тук кръга е малко по-различен, но политиците трябва да вземат при сърце този проблем. Защото в нашите страни се увеличава и броя на антисистемните партии и движения и се увеличава подкрепата за тях. Без никой да може да определи какъв е хоризонта, кога този процес може да спре. Това особено въжи за младите хора. И с това преключвам. Младежката безработица в страни, като нашите, е от порядъка на 30 до 50 процента. Това означава тотално маргинализиране на едно поколение. Това залага една много голяма социална, дългосрочна социална, от там и политическа нестабилност, която от своя страна ще бъде пречка в търсенето на разумните, на професионалните, на работещите решения в финансовата и в економическата сфера като цяло. Благодаря ви. Mr. President, thank you, sir, and thank you again for your patience. Uh, sir James Merlees is uh, the distinguished professor at large of the Chinese University at Hong Kong and a Nobel laureate. And glad to have your uh, contribution, sir. I'm going to follow very much what President Parvanov was saying, and I will show Chinese solidarity. I particularly liked what uh, Mr. Wu said seemed to me in thinking what should be said to the G20. Uh, the first thing I'd want to say is please pay attention to what is real, not to what is financial. Tasks and outcomes should be defined in, in terms of what matters to people. Uh, as been emphasized, we've got this rising inequality, which could go on for a long time if current policies are pursued. What do I think should be said? It has to be here. It has to be succinct. It has to leave a lot of questions unanswered. But it seems to me, and should be saying, in order that uh, people get, can get back to work, it is essential that the investment levels that we should be seeing now and we would be seeing if there hadn't been this recession, almost depression, these need to be restored. Then it is for the countries of the world to get busy and find ways of restoring them. Now, clearly, that requires international assistance. After all, a key characteristic of the situation we have is the enormous differences 
of the experience of different countries. But this wouldn't make any particular sense to some countries which have had nicely rising investment. Uh, but uh, I, I think that's the terms in which one could put it. And it's only in that sense that I think you could say that we know what the solution is and it's just a matter of doing it because there are indeed serious technical problems in achieving that, but I think it should be doable. Thank you. So James, thank you very much, sir. Uh, next we have uh, uh, Mr. Um, Nestor Osorio of, the, uh, of ECOSOC, President of ECOSOC. Thank you very much. There is a couple of points I would like to underline here, is that uh, the, the world is going through a very special period in which the developed countries are at the center as the more affected for the crisis. And what kind of crisis are we talking about? An excessive debt, banking fragility, fiscal pressures, and the most delicate situation is a growing unemployment in the region. And we are talking about governance, and we are talking about institutions. And Europe is the region of the world with the most sophisticated system of institutions. Parliament, Commission, Banking. And it is in the region with this sophisticated network of institutions that the economies are where more, fragi where more fragility we find in the economies. So I think that the, the corrections are needed at a, a national, regional, and then the common international uh, level. And um, what we are seeing here, especially in the, uh, with the unemployment, the growing unemployment, is that the, the, the manifestations of real social crisis are coming. And the democratic systems could be affected. And uh, we are, and I'm sorry if I go too far, but if things are not corrected, we are going through the European Spring. The Arab Spring, among the uh, other things, of course, the normal uh, quest for uh, liberty and the expression of democratic uh, uh, rights and the human rights was out of poverty, out of unemployment and out of the need of finding some ways of subsistence. So I think that the big problem we are facing here is, and answering to the question of Mr. Bington, is that we at least are identifying very clearly where some of the problems could be and what are the problems that are urgent to be solved. Uh, and as Mr. Wu was saying, we are in the process of trying to eradicate poverty, but there is something much more important and much more important in the case of the developed countries and the effect that it could have in developing countries. We need to create systems and to facilitate the creation of wealth. That is what is really going to be, the, how do we create wealth? How we are going to move this engine? The foreign investment, where is it going now? To Latin America, to some African countries, to some South Asian countries. The monies from Europe and the United States are not being invested in Europe and in the United States creating this wealth. They are going away, why? Because there is no confidence in the system, no confidence in their own institu institutions. The G20, uh, those who are not in the G20, the, is the problem of the clubs. The club is very good if you are part of it. If you are not, then you don't like the club. But what happened is that the club is not responding very well to the needs of the international community. That's why a more inclusive, a more representative, and uh, a, a more transparent system of governance is the quest of the world today. Thank you. So thank you very much. Mr. Alejandro Yarab, uh, thank you very much for your uh, patience too, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be somewhat repetitive, but very brief. I heard uh, the president of the Latin American Central Bank two years ago to say that he had no doubts that the politicians always took the correct decision. They always got it right, inevitably. But he added, the problem is that the markets don't wait for them. 
meaning by this that we have somewhat dysfunctional political system in terms of the speed and the depth at which they should act to face the challenges that we have had uh, in the past. This is coupled, what I think is more or less general widespread weak leadership. And that is a problem which leads in turn into difficulties in achieving multilateral cooperation or regional cooperation. Consumed by domestic problems, et cetera, and so on, leaders find very, very little room to move and to act in several fields. Climate change is one, energy is another. Um, you can go to monetary effort, financial affairs, and trade, of course, and coming from the WTO, I know that only too well. So what to do? And I think Dominique Strauss kind of spoke of the fear. They move when they have fear. And maybe one should inject a little doses of fear into governments and leaders for the moving that to act. Hold them accountable. The G20 has become an instance where it's too formal. They issue long declarations. The leaders discuss about 15 at the most of what is contained in that declaration. The rest is pre-negotiated by diplomats like myself. So, what if one holds them accountable? Year after year, one comes here, for example, other places and tell, last year you pledged to do A, what did you do? Nationally or multilaterally, whatever. Let me just give you a brief example, with that I finish. Year after year, the G20 declaration contains language for a standstill on protectionist measures and to roll back what they have done. Well, they've rolled back very little and they keep on applying trade restrictions and investment restrictions. Not good. It's true we haven't had a tsunami of protectionism, but the measures keep piling up. As I mentioned in one of the sessions uh, yesterday, protectionist measures today amount, and this is a conservative account, to about 3% of world trade. Just to illustrate, that is about the whole of trade of Africa. Or the whole of trade of Brazil plus that of India. So it's a lot. So we're making things worse. We're not generating new wealth. We're not creating new employment. We're not creating new business opportunities, etc. We're not taking advantage of low-hanging fruit, for example, that could be there, such as concluding the Doha round and many other things. Thank you. So thank you very much. I'm going to ask my uh, distinguished co-host and uh, moderator, uh, Mark Uzan, to, to comment on basically what you've heard up to now in, this, uh, in the contributions. Some, some sort of sense of storm pending if things aren't fixed is, is one, one message I seem to be getting. But uh, you've, of course, moderated so much throughout this whole uh, forum. And I wonder, when you put the, these messages together, what, what do you see coming through? Well, I think... Um we have to get back about the discussion we have over the last two days, and we commented about what Dominique said about the G20, because I think here we have uh, having a very informal conversation. We have the representative from Russia, hopefully will bring some messages from what we discussed over the last two days. I think the G20 in 2009, the London summit, was a landmark of international cooperation, and fears was clearly why you know, leaders decided to, re to react and overreact. And uh, questions today is, uh, we are going back to a world where we are more fragmentations, where we are less corporations. And I think that was really more or less, the reason was we created after World War II, the need to create an international institutions and institutions for machinery of international corporations. So we have maybe to get back to why we don't have this framework of international cooperation working today. I think, you know, we talk, is it the G20? We move from G7 to G20. Governor Jasser, Minister Jasser said, well, you know, we were preparing. The G20 was not created in 2009. It was created in 1999. There was a lot of meetings among ministers, governors. They were already prepared in case of a crisis. And we selected c countries, as uh, uh, Dominique said, you know, based uh, after the crisis that was originated in emerging markets. And we said, well, okay, who are the systemic countries in the world? And the G7 decided, well, we have to be worried. We need to engage in a dialogue with countries who are systemic. So we put Brazil, Argentina, Russia, countries who were dealing with crises, dealing with capital flow. That was a crisis of the 1990s. At that time, no one anticipated that the crisis 10 years later will originate in the advanced countries. The question now we have is, seems we have a vacuum of governance. 
So are we, we, do we need to create a new forum? I don't think so. I think we need to get back to an universal institution that is called the IMF, International Monetary Fund, that is the main mission of the IMF, and if you look at the article, is to have a machinery of international cooperation to prevent currency war, to prevent in, in, instability. So why don't the IMF, which is an universal institution, don't be able to promote you know, what is needed today in order to prevent spillover, in order to prevent crisis, and maybe to put pressure on G20. Look, you have been created as a club, as an agenda setter, but not as a way to make, you know, to decision to the rest of the world. G20 is a forum where you can create a consensus, and the IMF should be the place where we can come up with agreement. Mark, thank you very much. I turn again to the, uh, His Excellency, the Minister of Economy and Planning of Saudi Arabia, uh, Mr. Mohammed Suleiman al Jasser. Uh, I thought I would add a couple of points. I think quantitative easing, during the previous discussions, we, had, uh, we said a lot about it. And I said that it was, to my mind, it was akin to a, a patient who had a stroke and is being given blood thinners. That's quantitative easing. It will keep the patient alive until a more serious treatment is applied. And that is structural adjustment. Japan can do all the quantitative easing at once, but it has to do structural adjustment. Same thing for Europe. Even the U.S. Uh, needs some structural adjustment in some of its areas. And I think this is probably the most important uh, uh, lesson that we have uh, to take home. Uh, and, and I think we discussed it uh, uh, today and yesterday uh, quite uh, often. Of course, it's not easy to address because politically it's not very palatable. Uh, I mentioned in my statement today that uh, there was one European politician who said uh, we all know what we exactly need to do to solve the problem, but also we don't know how to get re-elected once we've done it. And, <laughs> and I think uh, Chancellor Schroeder was a victim of such, uh, of such a, uh, uh, an achievement, if you will, when he went uh, out for structural adjustment in the labor market. He was successful, but then he was not re-elected. So, Quantitative easing will give some breathing space, but it's not the solution. I think there was another, uh, during lunch, uh, I was uh, impressed by a, a speech given by uh, Joe Stoodwell, I think I see him there, and I thought it was very interesting that he, he derived this, uh, or at least he highlighted this dichotomy between the, the uh, economics of development and economics of efficiency. A lot of us are very well trained and probably have been in the trenches of economic development, but really economics of efficiency is much more significant these days, especially when you go to the advanced economies. They need to get into that, and that is all about labor markets and other structural adjustments, uh, bringing in the knowledge level of the workers and bringing up the knowledge of the jobs that are available and doing the matching at a higher level of knowledge, i.e. moving into a knowledge economy and a knowledge uh, society. Finally, I, would, I could not resist picking up a fight with, uh, with uh, my friend Strauss-Kahn. Uh, I think there is a bit of nostalgia to the old world. You know, when things were very simple, the IMF can go out and solve the problem, but that was totally different. That's like my parents saying, oh, the old days were much better, you know, when people, half of the population was dying of dif dis dysentery and other diseases. No, I mean, we live in a totally different world. The issues are much more complex. And by the way, now the problems are arising not in the developing countries, but arising in big countries, which are much more difficult to handle. And they are politically also much more difficult to coerce, if you will. And therefore, some fear is not sufficient because politically that's not palatable if you put in uh, uh, the fear. So I think we, instead of trying to be nostalgic about the olden days, I think we should really spend more time perfecting the mechanisms we have now within the G20, the BIS, the FSB, all of the other things, and hopefully we can zero in on the structural adjustment requirements of modern day economics, especially when we go into economics of efficiency. I'll stop here. Minister, thank you again, sir. Uh, I turn now to uh, economics professor and Nobel laureate, also senior advisor to the president of Cyprus, uh, Christopher Pissarides. Well, it's quite fortuitous that uh, the previous speaker finished in the way that he did, because what I'm going to say takes issue with what he, what he just said without knowing that he was going to say it. 
which is that uh, I don't think that uh, we're being nostalgic and I don't think we lack the institutions um, despite, or maybe following on from what uh, Romano Prodi and, uh, and Dominic Strauss-Kahn were saying, I think what we lack is the leaders with vision to make things work. It's the personalities that we lack, not, not the institutions. I saw that firsthand in the case of Cyprus uh, last month, and I'm seeing it all the time, and especially I see it when I compare with the great European visionaries who brought the European Union where it is today, the Giscard d'Estens, the Schmitz, the Delors, the, the Schumanns, all these people. The, the, the leaders we have in Europe now are completely focused in their countries. They don't seem to care about what's happening in other countries, provided they get votes in their own country, they protect their own interests. They don't have any Europe-wide objectives in mind or when they're taking action. And, and you know, I mean, what more can I say? I, I can give one example, my, that uh, decisions in the European Union traditionally were reached by uh, core uh, countries, usually France and Germany, getting together, uh, discussing things before meetings, deciding, and then the two leaders appearing uh, together in meetings and presenting a strong, ca a strong case. Well, where, where has France been uh, since the election? I haven't seen Hollande in, in a single Euro on a single European platform. He's concerned about his own country, fair enough, he was elected by his own country, but French, the French leaders traditionally played such a leading role, and they also played the role where they showed some more sympathy to the problems of the southern countries. We, we in the southern countries saw them as a link between uh, the German-led North and, and the Latin and, and Greek South. But they, they've been nowhere, and in fact, it has cost us a lot in Cyprus that we had to deal only with uh, Angela Merkel, with, with uh, Germany, in the negotiations, because they saw things in a completely different way. Even Sarkozy would have, would have made some difference if he was there, but I don't there. So, so if, you, if you look at um, what the problems in Europe are, for example, to, to bring it as an example, because that, that's what I'm most, most familiar with, uh, if, if we're going to make this currency work beyond um, the stage that we are now, where it seems to be one country with its um, uh, with the states around that is supporting it, uh, pushing an agenda which is completely foreign and hostile to the uh, to the southern countries. Uh, so I repeat, if we are going to make it worse, then we, then we need to take some action which can be taken within the present institutions. We need to go for complete banking union with a common supervisor, an institution that can dissolve banks, that can recapitalize banks. Uh, we need much closer fiscal cooperation, maybe even a fiscal union of some kind, so we need to set up institutions like fiscal policy councils to look after uh, that side. That, that can be done if we have leaders who could come together and, and do it, but we don't. We have leaders that are pussyfooting, procrastinating, and and waiting for one election after another to finish before any action can be taken. And when one election is completed, there are 17 democracies, there is another election coming up and, and we're waiting. It, it's not that, that where well, the commission, of course, wants to go that way, but, but the commission alone doesn't have the power to do it. It's the, it's the actual leaders that have to come together behind the scenes and, and arrange it. And, and in the case of, um, of Cyprus, for example, the IMF came in and, and, and Germany, came in in the name of their leader and they said, this is what we have to do and you have to accept it. And, and our newly elected president of, of two weeks uh, duration came in and said, there's no way I can accept that. It's what I promised my voters only two weeks ago that I will not accept it. And then they said to him, that was Friday night, all night meeting. And then they said to him, well, if you don't accept it, on Monday, emergency liquidity assistance to the banking system in Cyprus stops. Uh, we are not going to give you any money. Uh, to, we are not going to lend any money to the government either. Debt is coming up uh, for renewal, so you cannot go out into the markets to get it. So on Tuesday, your country will be bankrupt and all your banks will be completely gone. And what did he say? Okay, I accept. <laughs> I leave it at that.
Professor, thank you. Before I, actually, I want to get contribution from some of my colleagues here in the media who've also been involved in the sessions, but I know that um, we have, uh, for example, Mr. Romano Prodi. I know you have to catch a flight, sir. Are you okay? You need to uh, depart. We will forgive you leaving us uh, if you need to, sir. So uh, please, thank you so much for, in spite of uh, your tight schedule, joining us on this debate as well. So feel free when you're comfortable, sir. Um, I want to turn to, uh, thank you, a round of applause for him as well. Thank you. I want to turn to um, Mr. Artur uh, um, uh, Platonov uh, of uh, KTK TV and again get your perspective on what you've been hearing, certainly from a media uh, angle on, on the, uh, today's discussion. Вы знаете, спасибо за предоставленное слово. Сейчас очень интересно говорили о роли лидера. Как известно, вот Вольтеру приписывают слова, что иногда одного человека достаточно, чтобы спасти страну. Наполеон, наоборот, говорил, что иногда одного человека достаточно, чтобы погубить страну. Мне кажется, некоторое время назад был болгарским президентом задан очень интересный вектор нашей дискуссии, практический вектор и вектор с точки зрения интересов простых людей, которые смотрят за тем, как уже на протяжении многих лет выступают нобелевские лауреаты, профессора, говорят о том, что нужно сделать, но почему-то ситуация экономическая во многих странах только ухудшается, и экономические проблемы часто трансформируются в политические. И возникает вопрос, в чем причина, то ли советы и идеи, которые дают, они не настолько эффективны и, возможно, наоборот, приводят к усугублению ситуации, то ли эти советы не реализуются, то ли есть еще какие-то причины, однако нет результата. Вот я бы хотел, исходя из ваших предпочтений, уважаемый модератор, чтобы кто-то на ваше усмотрение ответил вот на этот вопрос. Спасибо большое. Thank you. I leave that open. If there is someone who would like to respond, um, please do feel free to put up your hand. We'll try to get something. Sir, please. По-моему, все очень просто. Те, кто диктует условия, те получают результаты. Потому что я уже сказал, что единственный консенсус, который был достигнут, мы не предпринимаем защитных мер. Мы держим рынок открытым. Но в то же время мы не можем печатать деньги. А страны, которые могут печатать мировые деньги, они используют свое преимущество для четырехкратного увеличения своей мощи. А поскольку остальные держат рынки открытыми, они должны это как-то финансировать. Поэтому вот этот дисбаланс интересов позволяет тем, у кого есть рычаги антикризисной политики, которых нет у других, эти рычаги использовать в своих интересах. А другим остается ждать, когда же до них эти дешевые деньги дойдут. Дать долго. Ну, проблема в том, что в такой неэквивалентной игре возникает колоссальная диспропорция. Поэтому нам очень важно сегодня понять, как связать эти избыточные деньги в общих интересах. Потому что если они просто будут перекатываться по миру и захватывать лихорадочно активы, входить на рынки, выходить из рынок, строить новые финансовые пузыри, а на сегодняшний день финансовые пузыри не уменьшились, объем деривативов на рынке по-прежнему велик, хотя мы говорим про Базель-3, мировые ведущие банки Базелю-3 не соответствуют, это все разговор, а диспропорции растут. Поэтому нужны срочные меры для того, чтобы найти способ не просто ограничить денежную экспансию через бюджетную стабилизацию, но и связать дешевые длинные деньги, которые сегодня э, накопились как денежный навес, в, в глобальных международных проектах развития. Вот мне кажется, э, Астана, как э, столица, которая будет принимать на следующей неделе руководителя трех государств таможенного союза единого экономического пространства, является тем местом, где... Очевидно, заинтересованность гигантского евразийского континента в прорывных проектах развития инфраструктуры, современных видов транспорта, логистики, новейших технологий. Если удастся это сделать, значит, тогда мы найдем консенсус, который позволит соединить избыточную эмиссию денег с новыми технологиями и новыми источниками роста.
Mr. Sergei Glaziev, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Stefan Grobe has also been a, a, a moderator throughout this and a senior correspondent uh, with Euronews. Glad to have you with us, too. Thank you, Riz. Um, I think we've all heard a lot of interesting uh, debates this week, um, fascinating ideas, not necessarily new ideas. And I'd like to go back to um, the most exciting question that has been asked uh, today by um, Michael opinion, and I want to repeat this, I want to maybe rephrase it. Um, there seems to be, you know, the proposal of the, the, the G Global seems to be a kind of panacea for a lot of problems that we all know about. And I'm still trying to figure out what makes you confident that a G Global, when we talk about G70 or 80 countries, will be more efficient, and more helpful than a G20. And I, I'm wondering, um, you know, whether this G Global um, idea can be um, a solution to to the global crisis. And with that regard, what is the message of this forum? What is the message of Astana um, going forward? What impact will this G Global initiative have on the global conversation that is still driven by the big powers? And um, Michael, I'm not sure, did you hear um, comprehensive answers to this question? I did not, and that's why I'm going to repeat it. Tell me why G Global should be the future. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Perhaps I can open that up and put that to Mr. Murat Karimsakov, uh, President of the Association of the Eurasian Economic Club of Scientists, who is a co-chair of the, uh, the event as well. Sir? Thank you. Прежде всего, почему G Global? Мы говорим, что на сегодняшний день те форматы, которые у нас сегодня функционируют, G8 либо G20, другие объединения, они на сегодняшний день не проявили себя с точки зрения эффективного решения и решение именно тех вопросов, которые стоят злободневно в мировой повестке дня. Это решение вопросов преодоления глобального финансового экономического кризиса. Не просто экономического, а глобального финансово-экономического кризиса, особенность которого заключается в том, что именно если до сих пор кризисы поражали и экономики с либеральной формой функционирования так или иначе находили пути решения, то сегодня мы видим, что этот глобальный финансово-экономический кризис, какие бы государства не решали в каком бы формате, до сих пор нет эффективных мер. И это просто очевидно, что сегодня нужно, так сказать, приглашать и выслушивать мнение тех государств, которые не входят в, это, в эти объединения. И именно мнение развивающихся государств, которые сегодня демонстрируют очень большую динамику развития. И вы знаете, что в целом тренд экономического развития, тренд, так сказать, роста сегодня в общем-то, прежде всего, имеет свою силу и направлен именно на развивающиеся государства. Именно это сегодня экономики развивающихся стран сегодня являются точками роста. И вот почему эта площадка, этот формат нового диалога, он должен объединить именно большинство государств. И эта площадка, мы думаем, что она будет более эффективной. Да, конечно же, я понимаю под текст этого вопроса, что если G20 страны, 20 лидеров государств не могут сесть за один стол и принять и договориться, то как же могут договориться 193 государства хотя в формате ООН? Вопрос, конечно, есть, но я думаю, что сегодня было очень правильно отмечено за этим столом, что на все нужна воля, политическая воля, нужна очень большая ответственность со стороны политических лидеров. И я думаю, что в этом заключается ответ. Спасибо. 
Mr. Murad, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Michael Binion, you wanted to add something here. Well, a couple of things. Firstly, I just wanted to say to Stefan, yes, indeed, I have actually heard some answers and some very convincing ones. And I think the best answer was that this conference alone obviously can't give the solutions to the world's problems, but the ideas put forward are extremely important and influential and will percolate up to G20 and to G8 and to all the other places. And if they uh, are listening, and I'm sure many of the people here will be at those conferences, then those ideas will have an influence. But I also wanted to ask another question. Excuse a journalist asking endless questions, but I think that's partly our job. It's not to think of the solution, but it's to ask a question, perhaps. And the other question arose as a result of a very interesting uh, panel discussion. And I must say, I think the panel discussions at this conference have been superb and extremely interesting. And one of the ones I went to was on uh, competition and competition policy. And I was hearing about the uh, extremely effective way that... Uh, uh, the three countries of the customs union are working together now to improve competition and to enforce competition rules. And then one of the questions arose was, uh, what, what lessons do we need to learn from the European Union in constructing this customs union of the three countries? And there's been a rather interesting contrast at this whole conference, and that is between those who are looking back at the start of the European Union with some nostalgia, saying, where is the enthusiasm of Robert Schuman and Jean Monnet? Where is that conviction of European leaders that the European Union was the way to overcome war and to bring stability and peace to Europe? Uh, there's a sort of nostalgia for that. At the same time, we've also had, in many of the discussion panels, a tremendous enthusiasm for this new union, well, it's not quite a union, but the customs union, which is happening right here in this part of the world. And that is the union of the three countries that are beginning to replicate some of the things that the European Union has done some time ago. And I wanted actually to ask what the answers are. What, if, uh, if one looks at the European Union, what are the mistakes it made that should be avoided in the construction of this new energetic enterprise going on in this part of the world. Perhaps as a, a, a final answer, I might put that to Mr. Dominique Strauss-Kahn. Uh, lessons learned, if you're willing to tackle that one. It's a lot. <laughs> no, I, I think the idea of trying to, uh, uh, not to mimic, but to uh, take advantage of the mistakes which had been made uh, in the European Union, for instance, or other part of the world where some grouping had been tried to apply it to uh, this part of the world is certainly a, a, a positive uh, way of doing things. And I could have myself a long list of things that shouldn't have been done that way in, in, in the European Union. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it's also, on the other hand, very difficult to just to, you know, to, to, to take some experience in some part of the world, in some historical context, and just to try to apply it in the other part of the world at, at another moment. So things are very, very different. Um, what is true is that uh, my view of what may happen in two, three, four decades is that we will certainly have a very strong uh, North American pole with the US in the middle, Canada, Mexico, some other uh, uh, Central American country. We will certainly have a very strong Chinese pole. We will certainly have an Indian one. The question is what's going to happen between Europe, Russia, and Central Asia? And that is not clearly defined. So in this part of the world, I forgot Brazil and South America, which is another pole. But here, between uh, the extreme west of the Asian uh, continent, which is called Europe, and Russia, and the countries here in, in Central Asia, the question, what kind of influence are going to be built? What will be the extension of the Chinese influence westward? Uh, how is this going to be built in the coming decades is a real question which needs a solution before trying to define the alliances or the grouping that are necessary. And I have read very little about that, but I think that's a real question for, not for tomorrow morning, but for the coming decades. So thank you very much. A very quick contribution on the same topic from Mr. Sedek Nigurbayev. 
Я бы хотел бы добавить несколько слов к выступлению господина Каримсакова по предложению главы нашего государства Нурстановича Назарбаева был создан Евразийский экономический клуб ученых, который на сегодня объединяет ученых более 110 государств мира. И ученые сейчас являются ядром, которое объединяет вокруг всех практиков, руководителей государственных органов, руководителей крупных транснациональных корпораций, которые принимают оперативные решения. И именно Евразийский экономический клуб ученых сейчас является одним из главных организаторов Астанинского экономического форума. Здесь очень важен диалог, очень важно, что в рамках Евразийского клуба ученых ученые-экономисты смогли объединиться. Это единственный форум в мире, где в этом прошлом году 11 нобелевских лауреатов участвовало, в этом году 10 нобелевских лауреатов. И очень важно, чтобы ученые, теоретики, которые в лабораториях, в научно-исследовательских институтах вырабатывают механизмы борьбы с кризисом, чтобы они делились своим опытом объединенных групп ученых, чтобы практики делились. И в то же время ученые также должны слушать практиков. И такой диалог, который в рамках Астанинской экономического форума, он показывает свою эффективность. Как вы знаете, в прошлом году мы довели результаты рекомендаций Астанинского экономического форума, участников Астанинского до Генеральной Ассамблеи ООН, до группы G20 и группа G20 многие наши предложения приняла. И в этом году я приглашаю всех участников диалога активно принимать участие на площадке G-Global, принимать участие по Печическом совете G-Global. Именно мы Ученые, теоретики, практики вместе в ежедневном режиме можно работать на коммуникативной площадке G-Global, готовиться к седьмому Астанинскому экономическому форуму, который состоится в третьей декаде 2014 года, готовиться ко второй Всемирной антикризисной конференции. Вы знаете, что сегодня были приняты основные направления Всемирной антикризисной конференции. Я пользуюсь моментом, приглашаю всех, всю общественность, всю интернет-сообщество принять активное участие в наполнении основных направлений Всемирной антикризисной конференции. Только все мы вместе можем решить этот вопрос. Как сказал глава, как в, своем, в своей публикации написал глава нашего государства, то есть ключи от кризиса можно повернуть только всем миром. То есть мы здесь скоординированы, здесь сплоченная команда, и мы должны все вместе отвечать на все трудные вопросы. В условиях, когда перманентно у нас проходят кризисы, только объединенными усилиями ученых и практиков мы можем ответить на данные вопросы. Поэтому я с оптимизмом смотрю на Станинский экономический форум, с оптимизмом смотрю на площадку G-Global и прошу вас всех активно подключиться к дискуссиям на площадке G-Global, которая начнется с 1 июня текущего года. И мы вас приглашаем в течение июня помочь нам выработать программу 7-го Астанинского экономического форума. Спасибо. Mr. Nugurbekov, thank you very much for that. As we wrap up, but you know, what someone once said to me that uh, these kind of unions, uh, political and economic, are, are like a marriage. And they illustrated it with a story of a couple that everyone knew to be very peaceful, very quiet, they never argued, everything was always fine. And one day, Uh, one of the, the friends went to the husband and said, I don't understand this. You've been married 30 years, never an argument. You never raise your voice, nothing. How? How come? And the husband said, actually, it dates back to when we went on our honeymoon 30 years ago. We decided to go on a, a horseback riding trip down the Grand Canyon in America. And as we set off, my new wife uh, was riding her horse down the steep path into the canyon. And after a few minutes, the horse stumbled. And my wife leaned forward and whispered in the horse's ear, that's once. After about half an hour, the horse stumbled again. She leaned forward and whispered, that's twice. And then after about an hour, when the horse stumbled once more and nearly knocked her off, she just jumped off the horse, pulled a pistol out of her bag, and shot the horse dead. So I started screaming. I said, what are you doing? Are you crazy? You've just killed a horse. That's madness. And while I was shouting, she turned to me and said, that's once. <laughs> Who has the gun in this coalition? I don't know. But please, a round of applause for all our uh, panelists here. Thank you.
Before I hand back to Mark to, to sum things up and close the, the session, just a quick reminder that there is a press conference that will be taking uh, place for, following this dialogue of leaders. It's going to be on the second floor in the media center. It's right after this session, and it will feature uh, participants from the forum, including Mr. Serik Nugurbekov, the Senate Deputy of Parliament here, and Mr. Murat Karimsakov, uh, President of the, uh, the Scientist Club, um, Sven Alkaye, who is the Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Europe, Mr. Wu Hongbo, UN Under Secretary General, and Nestor Osorio, President of uh, ECOSOC, and Mr. James Mirlees, the Nobel Laureate in Economics. So that's straight after this conference, the press conference. Mark, I'd love to hand back over to you now, sir. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, maybe if I may, uh, on behalf of the organizer, first maybe to invite you again next year for the next uh, Astana Economic Forum that will be taking place in May 2014. Next year will be an interesting year. You know, we will celebrate the 70 years of the, of the Bretton Woods Conference. So I think that may be a good way to think about what should be the next step for the global financial architecture. And I think maybe the value added of G Global, in fact, is, uh, if I may react to your questions, if you look at the system, it takes a lot of time. There is a lot of inertia in the international financial system. If you look at other forums around the world, World Economic Forum, you will make, ask the same questions. What is the purpose of World Economic Forum? What is the purpose of International Finance Forum in China and others? I think the main f issue and main idea maybe is to convene people who have different view. I think here for me, the interesting things, I learned a lot of things coming from this region that I'm not aware about, you know, trade integration, Central Asia. And I think if the world is shifting to this uh, year, I think it's important maybe to get an input This is different from where we are coming from, me, from Europe, and to get a sense that maybe if the world, that this architecture might be cemented also by these countries, you know, so the issue of inclusion is critical, and I think a platform like G Global might be useful maybe to cement the next global financial architecture. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Just a correction. Uh, for convenience, the press conference will now be held here, so you don't have to all uh, run upstairs. So the press conference is here. Big thanks to Mark Rosan as well, please. Thank you. <laughs>